All right, so let's get back to the agenda. So our next speaker comes to us from Wolfpack Country, uh, North Carolina State University. He's an associate professor of computer science at NC State and teaches courses in high performance system software and compilers. He has over 55 referred publications in numerous computer science conferences and scientific journals and has received over $6 million in sponsored research dollars. Please welcome Professor Vincent Free. Hi, thanks, oh, sorry, a little loud. Thanks for the introduction. I really appreciate the theme music, both mine specifically and, and in general. This is, this is really good. Um, and I also appreciate being invited here. This is uh, unusual for me to speak in front of an industry audience. I tend to speak in academic conferences and they're quite different. They're, they're a little different. One of the things that, that, that I found that is very distinguishing between an academic conference and, and, a, and a one like this with business people is that as soon as somebody starts saying something interesting, you ask them a question and they say, sorry, I can't talk about it, <laughs> which has really been very frustrating for me because that's, what, that's the stuff you want to talk about. But anyway, um, so what I, what I'm, I'm probably one of the, the um, Least, uh, least competent users of, of the technology that we're talking about here. I just got involved in this late spring and I started, uh, I met Flavio and, and Trish and I, and I started working on this and, and I immediately saw the, uh, some potential in it. I, I see even more now having come today. But I saw some potential in it <clears throat> and an opportunity came up for me to be able to teach a new course in this, in this coming spring. And so I was looking down and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to teach. And so I decided to teach a course that, would, that, that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. Um, well, I think it's next. Which one's forward? I don't want to hit the backwards one. So I decided to, take a, to teach a course. And what I, what I did was I, I, uh, I shamelessly stole the title from Eden's, talk, Eden's course, and it's called Data Intensive Computing Course. And then I started to putting together a curriculum, and I'm, I'm still informing it, and I'm, I'm still formulating the curriculum. And, it, and I've used a lot of information I've gotten today to, to decide whether, what, I wanna, what I really want to put on there. So this list is probably larger than what I really want to really do. But um, it's a, it's a, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tailor it to, uh, as, I, as I go along. And, and I'd love, I mean, I'm learning every day and I'm going to learn more from, from Edin and from some other people about what should go into this course. But one of the things that, that Edin talked about, which was great that he was right in front of me because he leads, he leads up, he, said, he's, you know, he teed it up for me. And one of the problems he was talking about was how he had to, was the problem of getting, uh, of getting ECL in front of his students. I mean, sorry, getting HPCC systems in front of his students. And so this is what I'm gonna actually talk about is how I'm going to use the VCL, our virtual computing laboratory, in order to provide um, it, EC, uh, to provide HPCC to, our, to, my, to the students I'm going to have in the spring so that they can immediately just start using it and they, don't, and, and they don't have any of the pain points and I don't have any of the pain points. I don't have to be, have administrator privilege because that is not something I, wanna, I want to, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, so as we have a, we are very fortunate at NC State to have a very, a very, um, a very uh, um, large and, and, uh, and, and uh, effective uh, cloud system. It's a, it, it provides, excuse me, a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of um, resources. It manages, our virtual computing lab support, manages a, many, many uh, hardware resources. And we have a lot of, uh, all our students know about it. We have training for that so that they can learn it. It also is a very flexible platform. So that I can create a lot of images, a lot of different images, different ones that the, that the students have. For example, you know, every, a lot of students need to use some, some standard software, Mathematica or MATLAB, and we'll just stall them in, a, in an instance and they can just pop that instance up and start using it. And they don't have to, they don't have to worry about, you know, they don't, have, they don't have to do any, there's no pain for them. And so we have a lot of, a lot of what we call images that, have, that are pre-configured and they'll, they'll support a, a certain piece of software for you. So the goal that I'm going to do is take that image and I'm going I'm to make, make an HPCC image on it. Before I go there, I want to talk a little bit more about VCL. Because VCL is, is something that's very, that, that, that we're really proud of at NC State. And so the, the, this was the brainchild of, of, uh, of my, my uh, boss, the head of our department, uh, Milan Voku, who is here. And he's, uh, he's also the Associate Vice Provost of Information Technology. And he, over the years, he, he found a need and he found out that this cloud computing platform that, that 
I don't, I don't think we called it that back in 2004, but this, this cloud computing platform is a very effective way to deliver these resources in, you know, in terms of time and, you know, and, and, and capital. And so um, he began this thing quite a while ago and eventually worked, this th worked it out so that it was so, power it was so good and so powerful and everybody wanted it that he go went ahead and donated it to the Apache Software Foundation. So this is a root Apache project and it has, it has at least 40 installations nationwide. This is uh, university installations nationwide. There's at least 40 campuses which are using our software to deliver a cloud solution to that. So one of the things I'd like to point out is that um, I, this is a trivia question here. When, did, when was Amazon uh, Web Services launched? Uh, Borco had it in his slides. Does anybody remember when that was announced? 2006. And, they, and, and Borco uh, mistakenly said that was the first cloud solution. Clearly, we, uh, you know, we beat um, AWS into the, into the space here with a cloud solution. So this is a, this is a pretty, so we're justifiably crowd, proud of this. It's not his fault. We've, it was our, we aren't as good at marketing as Amazon is. So um, I, I had, a, I had a 10 or 15 pages of stats to, to pick from uh, about VCL, and I didn't really, don't think I really picked out the best ones. But we, uh, I grabbed a cute little graph, and, and just to show you that we actually have, um, a, we've, it's, it's a very po powerful and robust system. And in, in the history of the, you know, the 11 years that it's been out there, we've had more than, more than one, almost one and a half million reservations that, we, that we've given up. And a reservation is where a student logs on and gets an instance. And it's run for you know so many that many you know um, uh, ten million hours. And then interestingly enough, and this is a, a stat that's that's uh, there's more than three thousand unique instant uh, images that people have created. So uh, our users have the ability to create images, and so they have a need. They have a need, right? What's the what's the open source? Uh, try if you if you have a if you have a, uh, an itch, you can scratch it, right? So there's a lot of people out there who uh, who have had an itch. And they've created a, they've created an image, and we probably could clean up them. I, I, I clean them up. I think a lot of them are probably uh, inactive by now. But there are still 3,000 images sitting out there that you can that you can use. So this is what so what I want to do is I want to create an HPCC image on the VCL. So that's the whole that's the gist, that's the the motivation of this project. This I had this idea back uh, in spring, and then my student went on a went on an internship, and then it got restarted in in um, August. So we're just a few months into this into this project. We've already um, managed to get a, get, a, get a little ways down the road, and we know what we, know what we don't know. So that's the really key thing. Uh, um, uh, 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 Donald Rumsfeld said something one time that I thought was very insightful. He said there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And so we, have a, we don't have a too many unknown unknowns. We have mostly just the known unknowns, and we know what we have to do to fix that. So we think we can deliver this product by, um, by uh, January, which is when my students are going to need it for the, for the course that I'm offering. So why do we want to do this? Well, the, the, even, though, you know, VC, even though HPCC has, an M, has a VM out there and you, can, and you can get up there, it's still there's a little bit of a pain point there that we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to um, make them go through. And the other thing is a cluster isn't really, isn't really that convenient to do on, on a laptop. So you, know, you really want to try to experiment with something slightly different for a cluster. So we would like to, d to build, um, give, the, give students an experience with a, cl with a true cluster. So our goals are to first have a standalone image, which we think will be the primary way in which they interface with HPCC, that most students will be able to just pop that up and start doing what they want to do. But then occasionally there's some, there'll be some, some, uh, there's some uh, learning experience that we want to give them with a cluster environment, and so we're going to build, we're going we're to use the, the, uh, the VCL infrastructure to allow us to create, a, to create a cluster, so some number of images that we can put together, and uh, I mean some number of, of, of um, nodes that we can put together into a, into a different into a cluster. Um, in in another goal, which isn't really a goal of this current project, but what we'd like to do is we actually want to we, we envision using VCL on a on a more on a more persistent basis, on a more regular basis, for for some some real um, uh, to do some real solve some real problems, not just not just turn in homework. And so what we want to do is we want to have a production level uh, instance of the VCL. In, I'm sorry, <coughs> of HPCC systems in the VCL, and so this is one where you get you get a dedicated, a dedicated uh, system that you can that you can uh, dedicated set of nodes and you can keep it up there, day in and day out, and so that those are the those are the goals that we're that we're working on, and we're on track to get the first two done in, in spring. Uh, I'm a little optim I might be a little optimistic. My student may not be as maybe working a few extra hours, but that's all right. 
So how do we, so um, why do I want a standalone image? Well, so I don't know what your experience was, but, and, and I'm, I'm, like, uh, I'm like John. John said that he doesn't, he, he had somebody set up things for him, and, I, and I'm like that now. I'm, got, I'm getting old, and I get the, and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't have time for that kind of stuff. In fact, I, I was really, I was teaching, I teach operating systems this year, and I was, I was teaching, uh, I was teaching about um, interrupt processing in, in, in Linux. And then I, I had this epiphany that I realized, you know, you know, an inter you know, you do the interrupt processing and the handler handles it in the kernel and then it pops back up to the user space. I was realizing that my whole life is interrupt processing. <laughs> I never get to pop up into user space. And so, <laughs> but that was a it was an epiphany. It wasn't a satisfying epiphany, but it was an epiphany. So um, anyway, so I, um, you know, I don't have time to learn this stuff. So I, but I did try, I did spend, I did find a little bit of user space time to dedicate to HPCC and I downloaded the VM, threw it into, Threw it into my uh, into my virtual into 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 VMR Fusion, and it didn't work right out the box. I don't know what happened. It just didn't work out right out the box. I did this second time and it worked, and so I don't know why it didn't work out of the box. But you know, it, that's where the cross the fingers happened. And, and, and I and I asked another student of mine um, uh, uh, to do it, and he he did that too as well. But then he just uh, he did it. He did the, he did the smarter thing, or, or he did. You know the more creative thing, I guess I should say, is he then just uh, just downloaded the RPM. He found an RPM, <laughs> downloaded that, and got it running from the RPM. So I thought that was I thought that was pretty creative. But um, the other thing too is the standalone image. You know, you get you pop on that and you get this thing. And now I'm and so a lot of my students would be confused by this. You know, which one of these do I want to grab? And now we have we have uh, let me see. I have uh, 5.0 or 4.2, right? Which one do I want? Do I want the 64-bit? Do I want this other instance? So there's a lot of reasons why I want to make this a little easier for my for the students. I we are uh, um, doing a class this this semester. It's a it's a first time offer, and so there's a lot of learning in it. But the class that's that's being offered it's it's joint between the statistics department and the, and the computer science department. It's teaching seniors um, from both classes, and I had the uh, opportunity to teach a couple of classes in there. And I went in there, and they asked me to teach about, they asked me to, to explain Hadoop. And so I was going to go in there and talk about Hadoop and HDFS and stuff like that. And, you know, like the day before, I'm ready to go, and they said, oh, you can't use code. <laughs> oh, because <laughs> it's statistics students. And then you can't talk about this, and you can't talk about that. And it was, I'm saying it negatively, and it wasn't negative. The, the teacher who, who was from the statistics department knows her client, <laughs> knows her, you know, knows her students very well. And she knew that, that I had, what I had to avoid. And so if you think about trying to get, HPCC into the into the statistics class into the statistics curriculum. If you want to get it in there, you you don't want them to have to install it in a VM. So I think this is a really good way to get them get them into that in that curriculum. So so the next couple of slides I'll just show you. I'll just kind of give you an idea what of what how we have how VCL works, and then I'll show you how we how we how we dovetail. In. So I'm not really going to talk much about HPCC from here on out. This is a very coarse view of, an, of, a, of a VCL, of the birth of a VCL uh, instance. So you're going to get a request, and then the, the system has to go out there and figure out where it's going to go. They have to allocate a virtual machine or a node, and then they have to provision that. So they have to find the operating system somewhere, on, or the, uh, the image that they're going to use, and they have to put it on there. And then they have to start it, and then they have to initialize. And these are my words. These aren't the official words in, in, in uh, VCL. But then they have to do some initialization, and that's an important part, because that's where we get to do that's where we, before we hand the image off to the user, we get to tweak it and make it, and make it um, do what, what we need it to do, which I'll, which I'll explain as we go along. And then finally, you tell the user. So that's what, that's what it looks like in a coarse grain, you know, kind of um, what a developer might want to look at to see, to see how this might, to, to walk through this. What, what it looks like to the user is the user gets presented with this screen after they log on. And then they click that uh, tab on the left-hand side that says New Reservation. And they look in that um, image and they in that drop-down menu and they pick one of the images. And in this case, I picked the, uh, the, sec the version two of our HPCC single, single instance image. And then I say, I want to do it now. I want that image to create, be created right now. And I, and I press create reservation. And then you get to this next screen, which is a, which is a waiting screen. And um, it takes a little while to provision it, depending on the, um, the really popular uh, images are loaded immediately. But the less popular ones, which in this case, which HPCC is one of the less popular ones. And, only two people know about it, so um, they, uh, it's it's uh, you know it takes a little while to load, and so then once it loads, um, you're going to get presented with this screen, which says you know it says now we've we've created it, everything's been done, and so now we've notified the user. So that's 
So the timeline that I gave on the first, which had six points in it, now that's the sixth point. That's the, the final point on that timeline. We create the user. And so now the user pr can press c connect, and it'll, get, it'll, get this, it'll find out the information about, about its cluster. Of, usually, users don't care about this screen. Because they, you know, they, they old, I'm sorry, all they care about this screen is the IP. They grab the IP, and then they just do something to get to it. They SSH onto it or do some kind of a way to, to get onto that node and start using it. Um, so that's, that's, what we, that's how the user gets a node. And so now, what are the issues that we faced in trying to get this to work? One of the things we wanted to make sure, we, we had to do authentication. And we had to figure out how to get persistent store. Because this is an, this is a, you know, an instance. It's a, it's, a, it's a temporary instance. The image is, is a general purpose instance. We don't make one for every, you know, we don't make a unique one for every user in the, in the, in the, in the university. We make one of them, and we have to make sure only that user can use it. And then, uh, and then I'll, and so these are the two, these are the two instance, two um, issues that, we, that we're trying to resolve. So the first thing is the standard way we do this is you take the, you take the IP and you SSH into the IP, and then you can, and you are, you're the, you're own, you own it. You can log in with your, with your university password. And you get to you get to do whatever you want as the as the you know the default user, which if it's a an Ubuntu an Ubuntu in, image, you have S sudo permissions on it, so you can you can pretty much do whatever you choose to do on that machine. So um, the other thing, so that that's fine. Users users can still do that, but they're probably not going to want to do that because there's nothing that they need to do it. They are, we're going to have it stand out. So what we really want them to do is we want them to go to the to the ECL watch page or some other you know some other web page that we might want to present. But if they go to the ECL web page, well, we don't want anybody just going there. We want only you, you know, to go there. You you created it, so we, we need to figure out how to how for you to do it. So we need to somehow protect that for the for the for the uh, for the for the, for the user. So there's there's two methods that that um, a, that HPCC uh, um, provides to to protect. The, these web pages that they provide through ECL Watch, and that's LDAP and HTT Access. LDAP is the preferred method, I think, and we're going and we're, we think we have a we think we know what's wrong with that. What we have to do for that, what we need to do is log is authenticate in is build this build the image so that it has the credentials so that it can log into the into the university wide um, LDAP server. The the problem with that is and and. So you guys, uh, there's politics in every any big organization. Or there's there's compartmentalization. I shouldn't have gone politics. This is not negative. There's compartmentalization in every organization, and we have a great working relationship with the VCL guys, but the LDAP guys are somewhere else, and I haven't even found out who that is yet. So we, we still have to you know track that down to figure out how to get on there and how to get how to how to be an authorized user to authenticate in with the with the with the LDAP server. It might be very easy. I just haven't. I just, you know, it, it's a matter of finding it. So what we did instead was we went ahead and tried to use the HTT access, access file. And this is a very simple method that we came up with. So we just generated a random password, and then we can write that out into the HTT access file. Sorry, there's only one T in there, HT access file. And then we will restart the process, and it will, and it will, have, that user, it will have that user. And then now they, they, you can log in with that password. Unfortunately, though, the user doesn't know the password. So we just send, so, but we know the user's email address. Well, we know, their, we know their ID, which we can deduce their email address from that. So we're going to go ahead and email them. So, after, so that same instance that we, that we created, in that, in that initialization phase, you know, when I showed you the timeline, the second to last one was, initial, was initialization, and then the last step was notify the user. So in that initialization phase, we generate the password, we create the HTT access file, restart the process, and we send this email off. And so then the user then gets that email, and it looks like this. And uh, I know I didn't block out my password, but that, that instance is long gone, so I'm not being, I'm not being silly. So uh, I got a password in my email, and I cut and pasted that into the, into, the, um, into the ECL watch authentication, and then the next thing I knew, I was, I was off and running and, and doing some work in there. So that's the current state of this thing. We're, we're happy with this, and we don't, we're not really thinking this is broken, but we think that we can make it a little bit better by, by, by resolving the, LD, the LDAP issue. And so that's the single, the current, ins, the current status of our of our single node instance, as far as the as the as the access permission. Um, the next issue that that we have with this is we have to deal with persistent store. So the easiest way to solve this was to was to was to um, use just our AFS base. AFS is Andrew File System, where it's, it's a distributed file system that we use. In, it's it's a uh, uh, for our purposes it's equivalent to NFS, but. Um, uh, if I was teaching a class, I would never say that. So, <laughs> but um, so uh, 
the, the biggest problem with this is that it's, is that it's limited in that you, we, the students don't have a lot of AFS space. And uh, that's partly because they don't need it. And AFS doesn't allow thin provisioning, so you can't give them, you know, you can't give them this large stats because it actually, it actually takes it up. So um, what we need to do, is, so it, that's the, we, we are providing them this in this case. So for this instance, for this uh, single system instance, we think we can survive with, with AFS space. We'll just let the, let the users use their own AFS space since they, most of them don't use it for much anyway. So we think we're, we'll be okay with using this. So what the VCL image is going to do is it's going to mount the AFS space as some kind of remote disk. And then we believe that spraying and despraying onto that, onto that, uh, that remote, the remote disk it was gonna be, is, is going to be okay. We can just, you know, through the, through the, the user portals, you can just, you can just access that, that remote file system that we've, that we've mounted. And again, I think this is sufficient for, for at least version one, the thing that I'm going to be using in, in the spring. So uh, um, I would like to make it a little better, improve it a little bit, and, uh, and a couple of the things are is that, the, like I said, AFS space that they're allocated is too small. A that's a, that sh I shouldn't have written it that way. AFS itself isn't too small. It's your AFS allocation that, you're, that you got at a default user. The other problem that you have, too, is if I want to run, one, you know, use it and try a, a certain data set, and then I start another data set, well, you know, I want to, I want to make sure that I don't collide and start writing over those things, and you know, because because if I between installs, how you know, how am I going to um, remember how this, how, how, um, you know, remember where I put the data? Um, the third instance is that if I want to do group projects, I you know, I don't know how I'm going to I'm going to make this work. So you know, I don't want everybody to just write have access to write into somebody else's AFS space because you may have other data in there you don't want people to see. And the other thing that, that I think is that I can't really solve until I think until I get more input from people is the solution I'm developing is going to be very specific to NCSU, and I'd really like to come up with a solution that that's that doesn't that, that isn't 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 uh, so parochial. All right, so that's that's sort of the, the the second one that I want to talk about is the is what I think is the more interesting one, which is the cluster image. And so this one we want to actually create clusters, and the way that this this works in the VCL is you have you can create these clusters where there's a notion of a parent and, and any number of children. So now I can sit there and say, I want to make a four-node cluster, so now I can have the parent and four children. The VCL takes care of all the environment, set, all the setup, so that they all get set up together. And then when, they, when you come to that initialization phase, there's this Etsy slash cluster file. And in that, you have the name and IP is of everybody in your, in your cluster. So now from that, I can deduce who I, you know, I know who I am. I can deduce all my other, all the peers. And so now I have the information I need to instantiate a cluster. The way you, the way that the, one of the ways you can do the cluster configuration is you can do it through the, through the GUI, which is fantastic if you only have to do that once. You know, if you, you know, if you do that once and it lasts for a little while, that's okay. But these, Im these uh, cluster images, you may only get for an hour. And you don't really, I don't really want to make them go through that process. Um, so what I, what, um, so, oh, sorry, this is the slide that I want to do. This is good if it's uh, for the novice and it's good for per if it's persistent. But what I would really like to do is I'd like to leverage the fact that we, ha that we have this XML file, envir uh, um, environment.xml, that is, tells you how the cluster, you know, what your cluster is supposed to look like. So I don't want to write that, though, because it's really easy to get wrong. It's very complicated. It's really large. But there is a tool that exists. Great. I mean, this is one of the nice things that I'm finding about being in the a HPCC community is that, you know, you guys, you guys have built things in the right way at SIP here. I mean, because there's, there's a command line tool to create the XML. I don't, have to, I don't have to go through the portal just to create the, X, the environment XML. So I'm going to leverage that command line tool. I have all the information I need, and I know what kind of cluster I'm going to do, and I'm just going to create the cluster and then reboot, the, reboot each one of those images, and hopefully they'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll talk to each other and will be, and will be configured. So now you still log into the parent node, um, with your with your IP, and but now you have a four cluster, a four cluster, or an eight cluster, um, uh, an eight node cluster to work on. So um, there's a couple of things that I want to do. Is I want to figure out um, which kind of a uh, oh I, meant, I I thought this was on the next slide, it's, but that's okay. Um, so the way this works is I have VCL hooks. So the neat the neat thing about the VCL is it has these it has figured out that that the user is going who's creating these images needs to needs to be able to get involved in certain places in the, in the, in the life cycle of that, of, that in, of that initialization. So we just got involved in certain one of those hooks and we set up a little function that gets called on that image at that hook. And so there's a little piece of, as more information comes available, you know, you can, you can start, start playing with it. So this is how we're able to, we're able to make this work. Um, 
And an example of how this works is a, like if you have an image, you have one image, one generic image, but, it, but it, it, it's, when, it, when it gets instantiated, every one of you is, you is the default user in that image. So the way that works is, there, is they have a hook that goes out and that creates the user based on the information on a, on, on a, on a runtime parameter that says, you're, here's the guy who wants to create it. So they create the user on the system, and they mount the remote file system so you can talk to your AFS drive right from that, from that instance. So this is an example of one of the, one of the uses of the hook, and that's what we're going to try to do. In, um, in the, that's what, this is the, how we're going to make the, make the uh, cluster configuration work. So this is the idea. We create the cluster configuration, the environment. All, we, uh, we have all the information we need, and we can execute that command line tool. We just need to then set up SSH keys because that's the, you know, so that they're, they, they recognize each other and will listen to each other. And then we just start the HPC seed services. So our current issues right now are that we, we haven't figured out how to do the, the passwordless SSH sharing because we, have to, we think we know how to do it, but there's certain information we want to make sure is present on all machines at a certain point in the initialization phase so that they, can all, they all have the keys from all their other, all their other peers. And we, so we think we can make that work. The problem is that the VCL in general doesn't like um, S sharing SSH keys, so we're going to have to figure out a way to get around that. The persistent storage problem has now become twice as big or maybe 10 times as big of a problem. So we have not come up with the, a, an ideal solution for that. And then the next thing is we want to have an image for any kind of configuration that we want. We may want a four-node cluster or an eight-node cluster, and we'd like to be able to may have, want to have two Thors and two Roxies or just, two, just four Thors. So we, we have to figure out which, kind of, which ones of those are. All right, so um, last, I'm going to wrap the kind of, I'm now rounding this out. So the whole goal of this was to, was to create a, was to make it, uh, to teach, because that's what, that's what we're, that's our goal, uh, you know, as, as, uh, at NC State is to, is to train, train our students. So I think that what's really great, because I can use HPCC as, as a vehicle to teach concepts, because I, I'm not really, uh, you know, you guys teach HPCC, but I teach students. To, to the general knowledge, and they, they're, so they're becoming very, very good employees for you. And the great thing I think about HPCC is it allows me to teach at almost any one of the levels. You know, I can do it at a lot of different levels. I can, I can approach the applications with ECL, and I can also talk about, you know, system performance and, and system design. So, um, in summary, what I've created is, uh, is, a, is a standalone prototype. I have a, a pretty good idea for how to do the cluster prototype. I still have a few issues that I have to resolve. And, and I mean, suggestions are welcome. Um, uh, I didn't give you my email address, though. Sorry. So talk to Trish. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I'm, I, I have 55 seconds for questions. Sorry about that. I meant to stop sooner. Yes, sir. Okay. So the question is: uh, is based on my experience so far. Are there different types of students that I can teach HPCC to versus Hadoop? And so I, I apologize. I mean, I'll say my experience is that I don't have any experience, but I can extrapolate from this. And there is no doubt, uh, the, the extrapolation, I'm, I'm extrapolating from my graduate students. And so my graduate students have, have done a, uh, research on HPCC, on, on, on Hadoop for a while, and a couple of them are now starting to look at HPCC. And I, I, in my opinion, I think that there are, there, are, there are a couple of things that make HPCC more interesting, more desirable to work with. And this is from a graduate student perspective, not from a teaching perspective. The documentation is better. The ECL language is, is, is very neat to program. At least I'm, I, I think it's a lot of fun. And it's not Java. I, I could go on for a long time about why, not, why Java is a bad idea. But I won't go into that. That's, a, that's another talk. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Good job. Thank you, sir. All right. All right, thanks, Vincent. So the VCL, um, I, I was sitting next to Borco, so I did, did not realize that it predated the Amazon cloud. Um, so it's pretty good by the, the wolf pack. Um, I guess hopefully next year we'll see a different graph with the use of HPCC within the VCL growing uh, with the, the big audience that you have there. All right, so the next speaker, uh, continuing with the ACC theme, uh, they come to us from Clemson University. Uh, at Clemson, they have the Palmetto Cluster, 
uh, which ranks in the top five in the United States uh, for all university-owned supercomputers. Um, so today we have three presenters from Clemson who are going to share with us how HPCC is used in an academic research environment to support research and big data. So we have Professor and Chair of the Division of Computer Science, Amy Apon, Research Associate of the School of Computing, Lynn Go, and PhD student and, and machine learning intern at LexisNexis. He actually sat right outside my office all summer, so chatted with him a few times. Michael Payne, so come to the stage, Tigers. Thank you very much. It's really our pleasure to be here this afternoon to be able to talk to you all about the work that we're doing at Clemson University. So as you said, I'm Amy Apon. I'm professor and chair of the computer science division in the School of Computing at Clemson University. And I also direct the Big Data Systems Lab. And I have with me a couple of my colleagues who are going to help describe our work today. So Clemson brings several kinds of strengths to the problem of big data analytics. And one of them is people, and another one is facilities. So on the left of this slide, you see a picture of some of the people that are in the big data systems lab group. We have several PhD level faculty and research staff and a large number of students, most of whom are not pictured in this slide. We also have some significant industry collaborators. It's been our pleasure to be working with LexisNexis and Flavio and his team for about a year now. And we'll talk more about what we're doing with HPCC. You see Ling and Mike also in this, in this photo. And one of the takeaway messages is that everyone from Clemson looks great in orange. <laughs> Okay, so on the right of this slide, you see a photograph of our data center. Clemson has a data center that has 30,000 square feet of raised floor. This is a lot for a U.S. university. And then a smaller photograph that's a, a photo of Palmetto. And as, as you've been hearing, this ranks right now in the top five of U.S. academic resources. It has about 2,000 whole computer nodes, about 20,000 compute cores, and we also have about 600 GPU cards in the whole system. It, it runs right now at a little more than a half a petaflops of capability. In addition to the computing resource, Clemson is connected to Internet 2 at 100 gigabits a second through the InSight network. And so these resources together with our Internet connectivity and the computing resource and the data center put Clemson first in class in its ability to, to work on big data problems. The Big Data Systems Lab has the vision of performing world-class research on the systems and enabling information technology for advanced data analytics. Big Data Systems Lab research is divided into three different core areas. On the left, part of our research is in systems and architecture. One of our research projects has been to look at software-defined networking as an enabling technology for being able to move big data around a large compute cluster. In the middle, you see a research area of tools and operations. Part of our research is to do performance analysis and evaluation of a, a broad area of middleware tools. And we leverage strongly the Palmetto supercomputing cluster in our, in our, research, and, uh, in our research experiments. So the little jumping elephant that you see there represents a project that we have right now where we're developing a new kind of middleware that is a maneuverable application. And the idea with maneuver is a, a, a take on the US military concept of maneuver, where we want to achieve a position, position of advantage against some adversary. So the adversary could be in the area of cybersecurity or could be avoiding some kind of perceived threat, like maybe a power outage. And so we're looking at ways to build maneuverable applications that will avoid different kinds of threats. Then the third area of research in our group is in data analytics and applications. We have several kinds of projects in this area, in uh, areas of automotive and transportation and health analytics. And I'm going to talk to you about a, a couple of them specifically. One project that we're working on where we're strongly leveraging the relationship with LexisNexis is to study the effect of high-performance computing on academic research productivity. The motivation for this research is that there's a lot of pressure on federal funding right now. And, and you may have seen some of the recent stories about the National Science Foundation and uh, legislators who are looking very closely at how the US government spends its money on fundamental research projects. And so policymakers are looking for ways to evaluate the return on investment for different kinds of research funding. 
Many times when, we, when universities try and quantify the return of investment, they look at raw metrics like how many papers do we publish, or how many PhD students do we graduate, or how many patents did we produce as a result of this research. And sometimes they don't take into account the inputs into that. So for example, how many faculty were working at that university that produced that many papers? Or what was the quality of the high performance computing resources that were used to produce that research? So what we do is we propose a new metric called efficiency as a measure for which to gain insight on return on investment. So with efficiency, we calculate an estimate of the possible return or the possible output that could be achieved by a certain level of input. So if a university or a department has a certain number of faculty, say, or other kinds of resources that are input into the research project, then there is a, 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 an estimate of the perfect amount of output that could be achieved with those resources. E efficiency is a calculation of the ratio of that perfect estimate and the input that's actually at, at that institution or in that department. So in our research, we've been able to show that locally available high performance computing has a positive effect on the ability of a university to do research. So in particular, if you look at, at uh, departments, chemistry, physics, environmental bi biology, uh, evolutionary biology, and civil engineering, we have shown that if, if you're in an institution and in one of those departments and that institution has a, an HPC resource locally available, uh, then on the average, those departments will be more efficient at producing research than if you're in a department that does not have locally available resources. So in, in that particular study, you see a map here uh, uh, of the United States that has some yellow dots on it. In that particular study, we measured the presence of high performance computing by looking at the top 500 list. You may be aware that the top 500 list is a list that comes out about twice a year, exactly twice a year, based on a particular benchmark, and it's voluntarily entered. So if a university is on that list, that means that somebody, they wanted people to know that they had an HPC system. In follow-on research, we're looking at other measures of locally available high-performance computing. So for example, instrumentation awards for the National Science Foundation and other measures of HPCC. Later on in this talk, Mike Payne is going to tell you about the data sources that we're using and how the HPC systems is helping us to be able to analyze the different kinds of data for this research project. A second research project that I want to tell you a little bit about is text mining of news reports and social media for business intelligence. So one of our team, Dr. Alex Herzog, is not here, but this is his research area. And the motivation for this is that government and business need information about public sentiment. So he is developing and applying methods to analyze large amounts of text data to enable inquiry of social and business problems. So this particular chart comes from some research that he did on the Irish Parliament, and he was able to track from 1999 to 2013 the uh, sort of the, the conservativeness and liberalness of each of, of, the, of the Parliament as a whole, and uh, he used the, the speeches that were given by the Parliament members in order to calculate that estimate and then track that also with their voting records. So in the next phase, we would like to do exactly that same study on the U.S. Congress, leveraging some information from newspapers and other sources of data. I want to tell you a little bit about how the Palmetto supercomputer works. So Palmetto is an academic cluster, and it's configured like most academic clusters across the United States at, at dozens or maybe hundreds of installations of supercomputing clusters at U.S. academic institutions. Typically what happens is a user, represented by the little laptop there, will connect or log in to a head node that is a part of the cluster. It could be something like an SSH connection. It could be through a web portal of some kind. And they establish a connection at the local head node. From the local head node, then uh, a user can develop source code. They can compile and create an executable. They can move data into appropriate locations. And they can specify output locations for results. Then uh, the user does not run the parallel application directly on the head node because that's not where the parallel resources are. The parallel resources are in the cluster nodes that are part of the cluster connected to the head node across the network. So the next step is to use a scheduler, 
In Clemson, we use the PBS job scheduler, which stands for Portable Batch Scheduler. And it works like a lot of other schedulers. The user has to describe, has to write a script, which will describe the location of the executable, the number of whole compute cores or nodes that they want in order to run their application, and the location of input and output files. And then that script is submitted to a batch queuing system. Now, in the batch queuing model, it's also possible to submit this as an interactive job. So you can submit it and say, I want my resources now. And then you can have access to them as, a, as an interactive job. Or you can submit it and say, I want my resources and run this application anytime you can. And I'll come back later and get my results at the location that's specified. OK, so it's important to notice that this is a shared execution environment. When a user submits a job, the, the resource allocator will allocate nodes on the cluster, typically in a mutually exclusive fashion that the user will use. The user will use those resources while the parallel application is running. And then when the application completes, those resources are freed for another user to come along and be allocated those resources. So the resources are shared both in space and time on the Palmetto supercomputing cluster. Another feature of, of Palmetto is that there are probably three or four different kinds of file systems on this, on this system. One of the file systems is the local file system that's on each individual compute node. So this is a locally available disk that is accessible while the application is running. When the application completes, then any files that are on that local disk have to be moved off of the local disk. Another file system that's available is across the network, across the cluster, as a parallel scratch file system, which is a parallel system that's across several compute nodes that's accessible not locally, but across the, the, the network. And then there's yet a third file system, which is a, f a home file system, which on our installation is implemented as NFS, but could be another parallel, say, PBFS file system. And that one has uh, a persistent quality, so that files that are there remain there as long as the user has an account on the system. So there is a lot of access to temporary local storage and access also to permanent storage, which is separate. When a user is running a job on a compute node, that application has user privileges only. You don't get root access. And so any applications that run have to run in user space on those compute nodes. So in the next part of this talk, Ling Ngo is going to tell you about his experience in using HPC systems in a shared research computing environment. Thank you, Dr. Ipen. <coughs> um, so our motivation to First, let me say that HPC system installed very nicely if you have root access. It handles everything from dependency to placing the correct files into the correct place. But what happens if you don't have root access? And the motivation for the root access is partly because of the um, condition for the Palmetto supercomputer. If you want to run things on Palmetto, you have to run as a user. And also, we want to be able to play with HPC in a very uh, dynamic way, we want to be able to quickly raise up uh, a node 60, node 32, node HPCC cluster, run it, measure it, take it down, and bring up another set of nodes and run it. And we want to be able to do it with the scale and scope that the Palmetto supercomputer affords us. And also another motivation is we want students to be able to use it. And many of you would know that students are very good at breaking things. So we don't want them to share a dedicated HPCC cluster. So that was the motivation. And so the question is, how can we provision and install and configure an HPCC cluster dynamically for research and education purposes? And so in order to do that, um, we need to go through two steps. We need to be able to configure and install and deploy HPCC as a non-root user on a single compute node. And the second step is to be able to dynamically provision H, uh, an HPCC cluster with that installation in a shared research environment. So next, we'll go through several of the challenges that we went through in order to make uh, this work on the first step. So the first thing is, again, installation and configuration of dependencies. HPCC is great if you have root access to be able to install and configure it. But what if you don't have root access? HPCC comes with a number of dependencies that is automatically resolved if you install using RPM or YUM or AppGet. 
But without that, you have to do all of this installation manually. And without, user, uh, without root permission, you cannot install it into the system directories. And so you have to compile and install this uh, dependency from source and install into a location that is accessible to you. Um, a good thing about this is we found out that we only need to do this, this once as after we, we install all the dependency into a location, we were able to move the entire package into a different user account and reuse that for a different installation. So I think it is possible to also package this as part of um, HPCC to, uh, for, for deployment. The second challenge that we have is we need to resolve the non-default installation path conflict. So again, if you install it as root, HPCC handles everything to you. It creates and distributes the run script and all the libraries into several system directory. You have the startup the, uh, script um, uh, link in the etc, and you have the major bunk of all the HPCC system libraries stored in OP OPT, and then you have the configuration directories, uh, the logs, and the PID, and the lock for all the different components of HPCC installed inside VAR. Again, with that root, you cannot do that. So we have to install it into a user accessible location. We have three different choice. Oops. We have three different choices. We can either install it into the home directory. We can install it into the local scratch directory that is available on every single compute node, or we can install it onto the parallel scratch directory that is available for all the compute nodes. Um, so what happened during the installation process is we run into several conflicts. And when, although the installation script allows you to specify the different prefix in install HPCC, um, some conflicts still happen and we need to go back in and modify the installation script to point it to the correct customized installation space. Um, and with that configuration installation process, uh, we still also need to work with the non-root deployment. So there's two challenges in the non-root deployment of an HPCC installation. The first thing is there are several um, root level settings that exist within the startup and script of HPCC, and we need to went through and either relax this or just combine it out completely. For example, we have several is root check that basically uh, kill the processes if the account is found to not be root, and we have to command it that out. We have several sudo call or several direct access call into the system di directories that we were able to avoid by just pointing it to the correct location and remove the sudo re requirement. Um, the second uh, slightly more difficult challenge is how to re 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 reduce the default configuration settings for the resource requirements. What I mean here is um, we observed that the components of HPCC are allowed to reserve as much as they want within the, within the compute node. And that conflict with what the supercomputer allowed. So when you get onto the supercomputer, you will ask for this many nodes, and within this node, you ask for this many RAM, this many CPU core, and everything, and you cannot overstep that boundary. So um, that was a problem that we have to uh, work with. So we need to go in and we need to reduce the resource requirement uh, for the installation system. Um, we are at this stage, and we have completed this stage. We were able to configure and install and deployed HPCC system as a non root user on a compute node. We still have some kinks that we need to work out uh, regarding the amount of memory that ECL is asking for, but I think I found out what it was, and that was my mistake, and I should be able to go, go back and fix it. Um, so now that we can install HPCC on a single compute node as a non root user, the next step is how to integrate it into Palmetto and ask for a dynamic cluster uh, deployment. So the user, the first step, the user would log on to the head node of Palmetto and ask for a number of uh, uh, and ask for a number of resources. And the scheduler will go ahead and allocate these resources to the user. 
and through the variables of the scheduler, the user will have access to the list and of this node and several other variables that can be used to design the, a customized environment.xml script. And this environment.xml will then be used to generate the configuration directory for all the HPCC uh, uh, components depending on the different nodes. And then we will, be, we will be able to push this configuration directory and the HPCC installation back onto the node that the user has reserved. And depending on whether you want to use the HPCC as a non-persistent or persistent storage, you would want to configure the data directory of Tor to either be stored on local scratch or to be stored on the parallel scratch, which is a persistent storage using PVFS. So uh, we have finished the first stage, and um, in our previous work, we were able to utilize and enhance a mechanism similar to this, not for HPCC, but for the Hadoop platform, and we were able to dynamically deploy a Hadoop platform on Palmetto for HDFS, MapReduce, um, HBase, and Spark. And we were able to use this to run several different research projects, as well as use it for teaching in a class with 35 students. And each student are able to create their own uh, Hadoop cluster and run in isolation from each other. And so this is what we aim to accomplish for HPCC. So, uh, I'd like to thank the help from the LexisNexis uh, team, particularly Xiaoming and Gleb and Jack Smith and Flavio with the flurries of email exchange that uh, instruct me to look into the complex detail of the HPCC implementation. So uh, next we'll have Mike Penn that talk about uh, how we use HPC system to manage academic data and also his experiments as an intern at LexisNexis during the summer of 2014. Hello, oh, okay. Yeah. Hi everybody. Uh, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, a paper that was recently, that was recently accepted to the uh, Scholarly Big Data Workshop, which uh, runs in, in conjunction with uh, IEEE Big Data 2014. So I'll actually be presenting this paper in about two weeks. Uh, and in this paper, what I wanted to do is, uh, because we realized that HPCC is a very useful platform, but when you go out to the, when you go out to, you know, the Google Scholars and the paper and the resources, you really don't see it being used. So what we're trying to do is actually increase the exposure for the academic community to be able to use and leverage this platform. So uh, what, I, what, I, what me and Dr. Apon and Ling decided to do is go, is go ahead and, and show the process that we use to integrate our own data into uh, HPCC. So, uh, HPC, so, why, so why do we want to do this? Uh, Dr. Apon already talked about the uh, our top 500, uh, uh, our top 500 H high performance computing uh, 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 process of, about trying to find the 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 efficiencies for ins for universities that have access to high performance computing. Uh, but uh, one thing that we have to look at is when we're looking at all these inputs and outputs, they come from a variety of different sources. So uh, so. And with each, each one of these sources, you actually have a bunch of different formats. So what we wanted to do, so what we wanted to do is be able to do all the pre-processing and, and all the integrating uh, under a unified platform and be able to you know, do it once and it's just there. We don't have to worry about grabbing this XML data from here or, or this table data from there and then putting it into something like R and then making sure we're pulling from the the, the, the correct places. So what we wanted to do is make HPC systems uh, our one-stop shop for academic data. Uh, and here's an example of some of the sources that we have available to us. Uh, they fall under different categories, uh, the high-performance computing capability, uh, uh, funding support, uh, we are, and then uh, different research, uh, research data sets like papers uh, from Scopus or Web of Science. And here are some of the formats that, that we get. For example, the integrated post 
secondary educational data system, I got that right this time, <laughs> has, uh, they, they have a lot of information about uh, fi financials on, on uh, higher education institutions, and these are, in Excel, these are in Excel spreadsheets. And in NSF, we have awards uh, that has the date, the amount of funding, uh, the program, the program and, the, and the director that are funding this, and these are in XML large XML files with a bunch of uh, nested uh, child-parent child relationships. Uh, the same with, whoops, uh, the, sa the same with, uh, with Scopus. Uh, uh, thanks to LexisNexis, we have access to some of the Scopus data uh, that has the metadata for uh, papers published within, within the United States from 1996 to 2012 in the areas of uh, chemistry, computer science, and economics. And, uh, that's also in very, very large XML files, and, and so what we want to do is bring all of these things together. Uh, this is an example of how we started to integrate these things with iPads being, being the center. We, we kind of coalesce everything around it. We have different, where is that, oops, that's not the button, there it is. <laughs> uh, if you look over here, uh, so there was some manual match so we have unit IDs that connect to iPads. We have we have name matches to Web of Science. We have name we have name matches to uh, an address similarity to Scopus. Uh, we have National Institutes of Health, uh, and there's a whole there's a host of different ways that we actually connect this data together. And what we did in this paper is actually step through the ECL code uh, to actually show users or people that want to pick up HPCC, how to actually do this, a step-by-step -step tutorial with data that they are actually inter interested in. So what we're hoping is that uh, after this paper is presented, that they can uh, go and, because these are pub most of these are public data sources, that they can go and pick up these things for themselves and actually be able to see the power in HPCC when it comes to ingesting data, cleaning data, and linking data. Uh, next, what I want to talk about, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, and next, the, the next thing that we'll be doing from uh, after this is actually moving our analytic processes to, to ECL. Uh, so we're going to be porting those. Some of these things, uh, some of these things are done in R, and being able to call those modules and uh, and, and be able to produce the, the same results that we did before, and then even using doing new analysis using HPC, HPCC and their analytic tools that are already available. And then we also uh, want to look at applying machine learning techniques. Uh, to the abstract article classification, which is a lot, which is much more difficult than uh, normal text classification because abstracts are significantly shorter than the entire research paper. So being able to classify these by different types of science within within the same discipline. So next, I want to talk about. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to. Uh, be an intern at LexisNexis Nex Lexis Risk Solutions this summer uh, as a machine learning intern. My manager was Timothy Humphrey uh, out in Dayton, and my mentor was Arjuna, uh, Arjuna Chala. And I was tasked uh, this summer to, to implement logistic regression uh, for dense matrices. So logistic regression, uh, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's, for, it's used for prediction and for continuous and discrete values. Uh, it makes no dis distributional assumptions on the predictors, uh, and the relationship between the discrete variable and the predictors is, is nonlinear. So this is an example of a logistic regression on the screen. Uh, so what? So HPCC systems already has the already has the ECL machine learning library where they have a, a, a host of different uh, analytic packages to be able to get uh, significance out of. Uh, find things within their data. And one thing that they has been rec recently implemented by uh, John Holt is the parallel block basic linear algebra subprograms. So in, in this, what it does is when you're, doing, when you're working with matrices, when you're working with matrices, uh, if I had a four by four matrix and multiplying it by four by one, uh, the result would be a four by one. Uh, what what PB blast or P blast, depending on who you ask, it breaks these matrices down. It partitions these matrices. Uh, for example, we can have two two by threes, two two by ones, and these two by threes are multiplied to these three by ones, and you you are uh, pretty much partitioning them 
and 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 uh, multiplying these these sub these sub -part these partitions together to reduce to produce the output, and then you're bringing those back together to produce the the four by one matrices. Uh, and one of one of the reasons that this was that this needed to be done is that there was already an implementation of logistic regression in the ECL machine learning library, but it was slower than what they would like to see. So I was tasked to be able to I was tasked to to uh, re-implement this and leverage this this uh, PB blast. And some of the results that I had from this and this these uh, results are from the Higgs uh, Boston project. Uh, looking, it's a high perform, I mean, high energy physics project where they're trying to classify, um, where they're trying to classify some things. But, uh, and I partition these into a uh, thousand data set, ten thousand, and a hundred thousand. And the the normal the normal implementation uh, previously uh, for a thousand uh, a thousand instances trying to classify took about 15 minutes. And, the, and these had 28, uh, 28 different attributes per, per record. And for 1,000, it took about 15. But when you look at 100,000, it took a, a, over half an hour. Uh, after uh, I finished the implementation, we were down to roughly about six minutes for each one of those. Uh, and this, I said, I'm trying to save space. So I, this is a hard-coded mapping. What I did uh, on top of that was implemented a, a auto, a auto block vector block vector mapping. So whenever you wanted to use the, the PB blast, you didn't have to worry about how you wanted to break down these matrices. So uh, this uh, function, this module will be able to take the number of, uh, of the size of your cluster and uh, the size of your data set and, and actually scale that down and break it down in, uh, into partitions that are compatible. Uh, uh, and this is another. Uh, this, and this is another experiment that I, that I did with the, some Elsevier data that was available to me. And uh, this is just for 100, oops. This is just for, this is just, whoo, this is just for 100. And what you can see with the auto, with the auto mapping, uh, we went from about 20, 20 minutes to, 20 minutes to uh, again around six minutes. But then if we scale it up and look at a larger number of instances for uh, 1,000 instances, uh, using a non-PB blast took about four hours. I mean, no, six hours, I'm sorry. So it took a very long time. Uh, and then with the PB blast implementation, using the auto map feature, we actually got it uh, under an hour. Uh, currently, logistic regression and its supporting functions with the auto block vector mapping, uh, they've been documented and merged into the ECL GitHub repository. Uh, uh, I also implemented the, the element-wise uh, multiplication for, for PB blasts, uh, and there's also test functions uh, available for the auto block vector mapping. So then, if you didn't want to actually go through the process of, of, uh, of having your, your ECL code come up with the partitions each and every time, you can plug your numbers into this, uh, into this function, and it'll provide it, and then you can actually hard code it yourself. Uh, and there's also some uh, some uh, logistic regression sample code, and currently I'm working on uh, k-means implementation that utilizes PB blast as well. All right, thank you. So uh, that. Thank you very much. That concludes our formal presentation. I'm going to get these guys to come back up here in case you have any questions for them. The machine learning library that's on the HPC uh, systems website the same as what's on GitHub, and how often is that updated? Like, if we've downloaded that machine learning library, is when does it become obsolete and we need to, you know, we get that code? Well, that's actually not a question for me. <laughs> I I do the tasks that are that are that are given to me, but from from just working with it, I, I tend to see that there's that there's pull requests always merging just about. So I'm pretty sure, um, I think maybe John Holt or Arjuna are probably be better, well suited to answer that question.
GitHub is um, updated really whenever anyone puts in a pull request and I get time to review it. <laughs> so, um, oh gosh, I guess Victor's up to something about once every 60 days. Mike's been putting <coughs> stuff in about once every 60 days. Probably between them it changes about once a month. Um, but you know, if you want to get typing, I'll get someone else to do the review and it will update more frequently. But um, before we cut across a new branch, we like to do a full regression test. Um, one of the things we do get them to do, it's not quite as formal as unit testing, but they actually have to put in the test programs to show that their code is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And they give performance metrics for uh, the different size machines because some people, they develop them on five nodes and it runs really great and they assume it will run on 100 and well, no, not so much because you made assumptions about the distribution or something. So it, it can take a while between when someone announces, oh, this is really cool, to when you can actually run it on 100 nodes and it runs 100 times faster than if it's just on your little laptop. Looks like there's a question over here. She's heading that way. Uh, this question is for, for Lynn. H have you considered using something like Docker um, to roll out the HPCC to containerize it on your HPC system? Uh, Are you no. Familiar, familiar Does it product? require root access? No, it, so. no, it doesn't, but it'll containerize the entire package so you, you pr probably won't have to redo all the all your pathing. You can you can drop it in there in the existing path and start up the Docker binary and and uh, and save you a lot of time. Yeah, uh, I, I'd love to be able to know about that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Also, it, 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 uh, I'm not sure how much overhead that may be associated with that, but one of the things that we want to do. Uh, as far as testing and comparing these to other big data platforms is actually be able to run this on the bare bones hardware. So, uh, and we, and since we do have other big data platforms actually running on this hardware, we want to be able to have a fair comparison when we do these things. So it'll kind of take away from the process that we uh, included another layer. Docker's containerized, so it runs on the native kernel. It's not, it's not okay. virtualization, it's containerization. It's different. Okay, more questions? Okay, I don't see any more. So uh, I, I want to just point out that I, I have a photograph here of us plus our colleague Alex Herzog who's working on the text mining. And uh, this is the core research group working with LexisNexis for the Big Data Systems Lab. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lynn. Good job. Thank you, Amy, Lynn, and Michael. Um, real cool to hear how HPCC is being used at Clemson, and uh, we really appreciate you guys going out and spreading the word to the academic community so we can get even more universities involved. So, Michael, you'll have to let us know how your presentation goes in a couple weeks uh, when you present that. All right, getting to the home stretch. Uh, our next speaker is an architect with LexisNexis Risk Solutions. Uh, today he's going to be discussing the power of Kel and how we're taking it into the great wide open with the community edition. Eric Blood. Okay, well I'm here today to talk about Kel, which is one of those acronyms that Fabio talked about this morning. I'm also another brainchild of David Bayless, which I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, you may think, well, don't, another language, don't we already have enough? Um, ECL, SALT, well, I'm gonna address that a little bit, why, why, we have, why, why we want Kel, why we might need Kel. And then once I do that, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go in and do an overview of some of the major aspects of Kel, which includes um, entity modeling and, and developing knowledge, intra-entity knowledge, which I'll describe, and inter-entity knowledge, and then delivering that knowledge that you develop. Okay, so why do we have Cal? Why are we, why are we doing it? 
this is a quote from Wikipedia saying, creating a domain-specific language with software to support it rather than reusing an existing language can be worthwhile if the language allows a particular type of problem or solution to be expressed more clearly than the existing language would allow or the type of question and the type of question appears sufficiently often. This is the basic rationale for CAL and ECL and SALT, all of them domain-specific languages. So what is the type of problem that CAL is particularly suited for then? Well, CAL stands for Knowledge Engineering Language. And what is knowledge engineering? Well, that's a term that came into use in connection with expert systems, which are systems that were are intended to take the knowledge of an expert and code it into a computer so that the computer can try to make decisions that would otherwise require an expert. Things like medical diagnosis or other things. Now, we're not so interested in developing those specific kinds of expert systems, but we are interested very much in taking the expert knowledge, applying it to big data problems, using the, all the data resources that we have to develop knowledge that can then produce actionable results for our customers. So it can actually produce some measures that mean something and help them predict risk or so forth. So um, as an example, one of the first projects that we've tried to apply Kel to is involving trying to identify identity fraud. So we're, we're talking about a big, a big data problem which needs this knowledge engineering. So, like I said, it, we're taking the knowledge of an expert. So we've, we've got, we're starting with an expert, a bright person, who's, got, who's going to try to tackle this problem. Now that person, working at LexisNexis at least, has a number of resources available to them. We've got over 300 data type files containing data that might be applicable to the problem. And of course, we also, we also have HPCC and ECL and very powerful combinations of data and a major tool. But I would submit for this kind of problem, if all that, if they're sitting at their desk and this is all they have, they're probably banging their head, have a headache, and now have ice pack on their head. They need a little bit more, but we have quite a bit more already. We've got some other tools like SALT, the machine learning library that we've heard quite a bit about today. We've got language, natural language processing um, library and tools. We also have a lot of institutional knowledge here. Um, we have EDA, Roxy key design, graph traversal algorithms, things that are known here and where the knowledge can be gathered from other or the, the, this bright person may already have. And then we also have, on top of that, some other tools and or knowledge. The red represents tools, the green kind of knowledge in, in this. Um, we have visualization tools and, and knowledge and network and expertise and some tools on network analytics. Now this bright person has quite a lot available to them um, if they know all of these things here and know how to use all these tools and are ready to, to go for this. Now, now let me tell you, there aren't a whole lot of people who have that whole skill set to attack a new problem like this, um, unless your name is Joe or Jesse. Um, so what Kel is designed to do is to, well, okay, I forgot. Um, so this person now has a lot, has a lot of tools, but they've got a lot of work ahead of them and they're gonna need to chug a lot of caffeine to get it done. So Kel is designed particularly to address some of these areas where we have knowledge and we wanna to try to add tools to help assist so that more people can handle it. In addition to this, it's got some little tendrils over into the machine, well, will, in the, in the long run, we're not there yet, into machine learning and it also has facilities for helping to manage what all those 300 da data types provide. So hopefully uh, when this bright person is using Kel, they have a smile on their face instead. 
look at this a little bit different on a level of, of abstraction for the analytics that can be done. ECL is designed around records, files, record manipulation. On top of that, we've got now SALT, which adds a new concept. It adds the concept of an entity, linking all the data together so that common things that are related to each other are linked together to form entities and relationships between those entities. Now, on top of that, we develop an entity analytics, or what we often call shells, where it talks about, where it takes those entity, information about one entity, develops additional measures and packages those up about just one entity at, at a time. On top of that, we can start adding social network analytics, where we're getting data not just from one entity, but also from the entities that they're related to. And then graph analytics, where you're not even just looking at the ones that are directly related to, but you're extending out into a local graph of the ones they're related to and, and seeing and trying to gather information analytics from there. And Kill doesn't reach down into this. It's addressed at the, all three of these top ones there to help assist and facilitate those kinds of analytics. Look, Kel generates ECL. I think Flavio mentioned that this morning. So anything you can do in Kel can certainly be done in ECL. In the project we recently worked on, we had about 120 lines of Kel. That produced somewhere around, depending on how you count it, a couple thousand lines of ECL. Now, there's a productivity gain there but it's not huge, at least for that initial writing. But if you add one, oops, wrong button. If you add one line to the CAL program, it may only add 10 or 20 lines to the ECL version. However, those 10 or 20 lines may be scattered in four or five different places. And in addition, it may also cause another 10 lines in several different places to change as well. Similarly, if you change one line of the CAL, you're going to have changes scattered throughout the ECL. So when you come to the maintenance, it becomes much more uh, compelling um, efficiency in that you, don't ha you have the machine handling all those dependencies and making sure all the right things are changed in the right places rather than having a programmer having to try to make sure that they get everything changed. So, move on into the actual, what does Kel do, and how, what does it look like? Okay, I'm gonna start out here with a sample entity model, because the first thing in Kel is it looks at data from an entity perspective. It classifies things in the world as entities and relationships to allow you to look and, and build and analyze that data. So, as an example here, I've got four entities, a person, a vehicle, address, and county. Each of those has a unique ID or UID, which identifies the, each entity, and then, of course, properties that describe the entity. And then between entities, I have various different associations. A uh, person lives at an address, person has moved to an address, a person owns a vehicle, vehicle's registered in a county, an address is in the county. So, look at this, how this is represented in Cal. You have, I set, have a set of four entity statements, which basically give a name and then list the, <coughs> excuse me, list the fields. Now, of course, real entity statements are going to have many more properties than, than these do, but as an example, this is the fundamental. There are some additional complications, but, this is, this is the core. An association is very similar to an entity except for its properties are references to entities. And so this here basically describes that entity model that I, descri that I showed over here in a graphic format. Now, that describes how Kel wants to look at the data but it has to actually get the data from somewhere. 
Shell doesn't deal with things on a file level. It, it relies on ECL for doing that. So what Kel expects oops, is that there is a ECL module somewhere, ECL attribute, that, define, that provides the data set, at various data sets that are going to be used to populate the entities and their associations. So for instance, I have this, this attribute here, raw AID clean, may provide information on addresses and address county association. Distinct moves might provide information on person, address, and move to. Similar addresses, vehicles can come from, a vehicle file might contain information on persons, vehicles, owns association, and registered association, and so forth. So, now as you can see here, entities are showing up multiple times because the information for an entity may actually come from multiple places. Different sources with different entities, different sources with different information about entities. In addition, one source may provide information for multiple entities or associations. That is largely because many of the data files that you work with in the real live world are really transaction based. They describe something that happened. So, and those transactions will often have multiple parties. So, you may have a um, property deed which has a buyer, a seller, and a, and a property. So that introduces information about an address to persons and associations between them. And so that one data file may contribute to multiple entities or associations. You may also have some data files that just provide supplemental data, like a UPS file that adds zip code to addresses. And you may also have multiple sources which provide the same data in slightly different ways, different names. So, at this point, we've described how we want to look, see at the data. We've just, we've pulled the data from some data sources. Now we're ready to actually do something with it in, once we've got it in that model. To describe this, I need to first talk a little bit about how Kel sees properties. It actually sees properties in two different ways. There are multi-value properties and single-value properties. A multi-value property has multiple values per entity. So for instance, name may be a multi-value property. You may have multiple versions of, of somebody's name. You may have nicknames, you may have middle names, a name with a middle name, a name with a middle initial, a name without the a middle name at all. You may have also aliases. Age could be a multi-value property because you may have multiple reports coming from different periods of time. Income could be because you have different reports through time or you might have different sources. Some may be estimates, some may be actual. Then there is also single value properties which for instance sex is usually a single value property, different reports are unlikely. Other things may not be intrinsically single, but you want to have a view of them that is single. So occupation, if you're mostly using it just for some informational purposes to add some flavor, you don't, you don't care about that there may be multiple ones, so you only want to see one. Name may be single valued, especially if you need a single name to tag, use as a tag and a reference to describe a person. So the real world has, in most cases, multi-valued properties. When you're getting down to analytics, you often want to get single value properties so that you can then do other interesting things with them. So one of the first things that a Kel program will probably do with the data is try to take those multi-value properties and produce interesting single value properties. So for instance, here this is a statement concerning a person where I'm defining a new property, which is just age here, which takes the input age, which is a multi-valued property, and takes the max and considers that as my single-valued age that I'm going to use in other analytics. Has a condition that says when this particular property has a valid value. 
and do similar things. I could take a name and use the mode to find the most frequent name as my single value property, or take a median of the, a multi-valued income to produce a single valued income. So you can do these various aggregates just as a simple statement like that and define and do that conversion. You can also use multiple um, properties to get to gather in more complex co um, calculations to produce single values and then you can build those on each other to do more extensive entity analytics. I don't have pr more complicated examples here, but once you've defined one of these properties, you can then use it to define other properties and build upon each other to get more complicated results. So once you've kind of taken, getting, taken the multi-values, getting single values that are useful for your further analytics, and you're then ready to start getting knowledge from the local network going between entities to determine new information, new knowledge. This, there are a couple of different ways this can, do, this can happen. One is we can produce knowledge from this entity compared to the global population. So this statement here takes the income that I've determined for this person and determines the percentile compared to the global population of all persons that I have and provides it as a new property. I can, use an I can use associations here. I can define when this person has first been seen in our system by when the first move to association shows up. I can count the number of moves they've made by counting the number of association links they have. I can go use the distance property of the association to find out the maximum they've moved the median they've moved, and getting even more complex, I can filter the moves by those that went to a vacant location and count them to provide a new attribute. All of these were actual examples pulled from recent projects. <coughs> these are pretty simple. They can build on each other. They can go more than just, these just go one to the nearest you know, using a move to find out where they move to. But with Kel, you can, uh, using this dot syntax, you can actually go, you can go from the move to the place they moved, to the county, to the vehicles in that county. If you, need, if you need to, you can follow the path along to get to other information that you need. Okay, and then once you've develop that knowledge, you need to deliver it, because what good is the knowledge by itself? We need to do something with it. We have a couple facilities for that. One is to define shells. And a shell define basically is <coughs> gathering a group of these properties we defined, packaging them together and for a single entity, and providing that access to that. So for instance, this shell here takes the, the person's name, the number of moves, and the number of vacant moves, and packages it up into individual records for each person. Uh, this is obviously very simple and, and not used. This particular one isn't used, but expand that to more interesting attributes, more attributes, it becomes very useful. And then that shell can then be seen as a, just a plain um, data set in a Thor cluster or, although this part, as you see, it's kind of been kind of hazy there. This part hasn't been implemented, but also, but it will also be available as a Roxy service to uh, pull by the UID. Then we also have queries. Queries are a little bit more general than a shell. Query allows you to summarize information across multiple entities, allows you to select entities by other criteria. So for instance, <coughs> this query produce, uses the county entity to produce a state summary. It groups by the state field here and produces a sum of the population of the counties in that state and a sum of the address counts for that count, for that, count, for that state. 
So produces basically a summary by state of population and addresses. This query here filters, takes a name as a parameter, filters by that name to, produce, to select just those persons, and then returns a set of properties about that. This can be just a simple set, that, but they can also get more complicated that this might include a pulling in the list of all vehicles that that person owns as well as a child data set that gets returned. Um, can pretty much become arbitrarily complex. Uh, so, let's see. One of the things that this will, we anticipate and we're moving into will be useful for is in connection with dashboards in which Dre and Joe are going to demo in the next here that as a, the data layer to define queries that can be used to show nice, pretty graphic dashboards. So for instance, you could define, one query might define the state summary that could be used to show a state map in some sort of graphical format. Then define another query that takes a state and provides details about, provides some additional information about the counties in that state. And then you can have another taking a county to provide information about the addresses and down to the residents. So this might be one piece of a dashboard that then allows drill down. And then with some of the other tools that will be talked about later today and in the future days, these can be tied together using HIPI and then, uh, and then turned into dashboards using circuits and dashboards that we're going to hear about in just a few minutes. So, okay. So finish up with a few details. Kel Light is now available on HBCSystems.com. You look under the projects, products and services, products modules. It's kind of kind of hidden down there a bit, but if you follow that, you'll find it. I don't know about under the new website, but um, or that URL will get you there directly. Kel Light, which is publicly available, is fully featured. All the features of Kel that we've developed so far are there but it has a 100-line source code limit. Um, it is not open source. We are not releasing the source, but we are releasing the, the compiler. Um, you need to have the, the ECL IDE, um, and it needs to be the same version as the Kel compile. So if you've got ECL IDE 5.0, you need the Kel 5.0. The ECL 5.02, you need the Kel 5.02 which isn't quite up on the, on the website, but should be hopefully within a day or two. That package, when you download it and install it, will contains the compiler, the runtime library, and a manual. The manual contains within it a tutorial <coughs> that can get you started and lead you through some samples and show you, let you do a few things. You, of course, do need an HPCC cluster the VM machine will work if you don't have access to another one. And finally, Kel is still considered a technology preview. It's under very active development. So there are, you know, any software in that state, you can just assume that it's not quite as stable, but we're working hard and, and we're actively adding many new features. And that's all. I got about three minutes for questions, I guess. Uh, can you comment on any of the runtime performance characteristics of writing in KEL rather than writing the ECL directly for a certain <laughs> type of query? Um, well, that depends on how well the optimizer handles that query right now. Um, there are a lot of, lot of queries that we've seen that um, will run just, uh, produce ECL that is just as efficient. On the other hand, there, right now especially, there are certain ones where it doesn't detect um, doesn't detect that it doesn't have to do certain things that a person might, de might detect. So that's one of the things we're constantly working on and we'll be constantly improving. And that'll, you know, that'll take time to get the optimizer handling more and more situations. But it does really good in a lot of situations, but not all. Um, and, but one of the really cool things is, you know, the more we work at it, the more we take all the little um, tricks that 
you know, David Bayless or Jill Luber know that maybe not everybody knows and get those encoded into the compiler, then suddenly everybody can use those tricks. Um, but it'll take time to, because every one of those takes some work to get to write into the optimizer. But, so. Behind you? There's somebody behind you. I, uh, in the <coughs> determining on the multi-value uh -huh. properties, um, you didn't have an example where it showed, say, um, say if you had multiple dates of birth, uh -huh. You might want to choose it based on something that was not bound up in those actual data of birth. For example, like a source reliability index okay. or something like that. Is that something that would be supported? It will be supported. Um, designed into the concept for the language, and, and we have some of the infrastructure in, in there, is the concept of providence. That as it pulls in data from different sources, um, it will track where, where this piece of data came from, which source or sources contributed to it, and how many records in those sources also commented on it. Um, and so now we don't have any language level features defined yet that allow you to access even the information we are gathering right now. It just goes through to the end. You can see it, but it's not accessible. But um, we will be adding those um, language level features to access some of that metadata. And as we, and now, like I said, it's rudimentary right now, um, but it is in the plan that that is an important aspect of what it needs to do is, and that's one of the aspects for you know, why it, Kel can be useful is it can handle all the details of tracking that all the way through the process, as opposed to everybody having to write ECL that, I, that takes care of that, so. But a very good question. I think we're out of time, so. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Um, VJ talks a lot about that evolution to simplicity, and I like the slide that had the uh, 300,000 lines of code in C++ down to, was it 120 for Cal? So when you guys write the next generation of Cal and get it down to like five, then I'll be ready to program. So let me know. All right, last speaker of the day. Uh, we will have two speakers. They'll be talking to us about some cool new tools that are being developed for HPCC, namely circuits and dashboard. So please welcome senior software engineer Joe Chambers and consulting software engineer and TV personality, Drea Lead. Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Drea Lead, and when I'm not moonlighting as an actress, I develop and design HPCC and ECL backend applications as well as working on some front-end applications for HPCC and ECL, um, two of which we're going to talk about today with my coworker here. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Chambers, and uh, our goal today here is to uh, introduce you to two uh, applications that we've developed. The uh, two applications that we want to show you today are circuits and dashboard. Uh, so we'll introduce the concept and also do some live demos, so hopefully the software gods will bless us. <laughs> um, Circuits is a freeform drag and drop ECL query builder. Once the tool is fully featured, you should be able to build almost any query you want to without having to write a single line of ECL. Uh, it will also be able to utilize the Kel language that you just heard about to expedite and make the generation of the code easier. Dashboard is targeted to the BI community in addition to building executive reports of the data stored on the HPCC cluster. So uh, many of you have probably seen the uh, flow tool that we initially developed. This is built on top of the Pentaho uh, kettle software, which is an open source software. We, we ran into some issues there. We discovered it was a little bit like trying to fit a uh, square peg in a round hole. It worked, but there were gaps. So the decision was made to do a uh, ground up 
implementation of uh, a similar query builder. So it's drag and drop, it connects. The interface looks very similar, but we don't run into the uh, same um, interfacing issues between the way the ECL paradigm works and the way that the uh, Kettle ETL tool worked. So circuits, like I said earlier, is a drag and drop query builder. We started with a basic plugin architecture. This allowed us to utilize any existing ECL code and load it as a plugin. Our initial attempt worked well, but it was uh, a little too narrow in scope. And uh, David Bayless uh, got involved, and uh, it has turned into another uh, software title that Drea will be presenting a little bit about tomorrow. Um, I'm not going to read my slides verbatim. So, The um, goal for the software was to keep the technology stack relatively simple. Uh, we wanted it to make it easier for our IT staff to deal with and also our uh, customers' um, IT staff be more willing to adopt it. So we didn't want to utilize a lot of uh, software languages and our third-party tools. Um, so for the uh, circuits uh, side of the equation, we're utilizing Java on the back end. Uh, there's no data manipulation when, with the Java. That's just kind of the web server language. On the front end, we're utilizing the YUI and JavaScript um, um, infrastructure, which allows us the uh, pretty drag and drop in the lines without having to actually um, get too deep into the uh, JavaScript and have to hand code it. We're currently using MongoDB because it actually fit the paradigm very well. It uh, uses a JSON uh, format storage, um, so it actually fit very well. Uh, but we've written it so that uh, that can be switched out with a little bit more mainstream uh, database system, uh, depending on IT preferences. And we've designed for Active Directory authentication, and we've backed that by MBS, uh, which is an internal tool that we use for groups and um, more granular uh, authentication to uh, access the data. <coughs> Excuse me. We believe that by making this web base, uh, the benefits far outweigh the drawbacks. The largest benefit is a tight access control and logging. As you uh, probably have experienced in your job, uh, updating a single uh, server-based web application is a whole lot easier than uh, maintaining installs on all the uh, computer nodes of all your uh, developers. Um, some of the drawbacks that we've uh, discovered and we've had to uh, overcome is JavaScript can be kind of a CPU intensive as well as memory intensive. Uh, so we've had to keep that in mind and test against older PCs. We didn't want to lock everybody into using uh, state of the art. VJ uh, wouldn't want to pay for brand new computers for everybody. <laughs> and uh, let's see, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Drea to talk a little bit about the uh, plugin architecture. Yes, I'm going to talk about where circuits is now. And then near the end of the talk, I'm going to speak a little bit more about the future of circuits. And that's going to kind of lead into a lot of what we'll be discussing in detail tomorrow. But what we have right now with circuits is a web-based interface where you can actually drag and drop different pieces of functionality. And those can be either primitive ECL uh, attributes and functions like join, group, uh, sort by filter, as well as plugins which wrap custom chunks of ECL and which can then be dragged and dropped into any sort of an EDA or ETL flow that you need to use it for. Um, it interfaces with the dashboard and it generates ECL from the GUI graphical interface that can run against any HPCC cluster. Now, um, it's interesting, what I'm going to show you here uh, the, the interface, it's kind of, a, it's a case of convergent or parallel evolution in a way. A lot of big data systems, a lot of systems that do data analysis, um, they've gotten down the data storage, data retrieval, have languages that can use it, and now you see a lot of 
applications at the point where you want to be able to allow uh, data scientists, analysts, and people that don't do programming to be able to use your application. So uh, if you recall earlier today, you saw a brief example of something called ECL pipes, which is conceptually very similar. And in fact, um, when I talk about the future of circuits, you'll see that some of what we developed independently in circuits um, has been re-envisioned in a more generic and reusable way with Hippie. So I'm going to give you a brief demo of circuits. What you're seeing here is the application. Um, as Joe mentioned, it's web-based. And here we have a small set of input steps and transform steps. Now, what this can do is uh, can take data from pretty much any HPCC cluster. You can select a particular file. Then you can perform various actions with that file. Now, these plugins that you see here, uh, they are custom-coded circuit plugins that wrap ECL um, functions such as join. And here you see we can actually cover the entire functionality of the ECL join, which is fairly complex if you want to be able to control the specifics. And another thing you can do is um, plugins. I mentioned plugins briefly, and plugins really are the future of applications like this. If we take a look at some of these, you can select plugins from a repository. And what I'm going to show you here is an example of an NLP flow. Now, this is a very simple flow, but it actually encapsulates a lot of interesting work that's going on. Um, what I'm doing here is we have a plugin. That plugin takes a chunk of ECL, which in turn is integrating with an external Java plugin library, which is wrapping the Stanford NLP entity extraction library. Now, there are a lot of, um, a lot of these various libraries and plugins out there. Stanford's just the one I chose to use for this. So here we have an example of how you can take any data set, and in this case, we're looking at the Reuters uh, training data set here, just a bunch of different news, news data. Yeah, let me expand that. Is that a little better? There you go. Yeah, OK. I know I was squinting from the back row. Then I'm going to put it through this plugin. And all this plugin really needs is you tell it what free text field you want to extract that information from. In this case, it's body. Then I'm really not interested in all of the records here. I just want a few of the output fields. And I want to rename some of them. And so that's where the, the map fields circuit plugin comes into hand. And finally, I'm going to output it to a data set. Now, right now, circuits, um, it can handle data set outputs. It can handle um, indexing. You can actually output directly to an index that can be deployed to Roxy. You can also output to the dashboard, which I'm not going to show you right now because of VPN things. But uh, Joe will take over and show you some of the dashboard end of this in a little bit. So once you run this, you can see this is pretty easy to do. And this is actually generating this ECL right here. Now, this ECL is pretty simple, but once you start getting into a, a composition of 20 or 30 more different steps, the ECL gets pretty big. But the person using circuits doesn't really have to worry about that. All they have to do is run it. And once you run it, you get to see the results here and the output. This is integrating directly with the ECL watch widget. So that's another form of integration with circuits. And here you get to see, here's the information we had. And this particular record, we had five entities found, um, organizations, persons, locations. That's what I'm looking at now. And that is a kind of pretty short and sweet overview of circuits and NLP. What we're going to be doing, what we're focusing on now, uh, is going to be uh, expanding the various set of features of circuits to reflect that which is available in Flow. Flow has a pretty comprehensive list of EDA, what can I do, co-correlation, variance, um, a number of other uh, more complex EDA features. And so with that, we're going to switch over to Dashboard.
So the uh, dashboard is on the other side of the equation. It's a uh, custom built uh, BI tool. Uh, since this tool was designed from the ground up uh, to work with HPCC, it works a lot cleaner than trying to interface some of the existing BI tools. Um, we've tried using OBDC drivers to integrate uh, several of them. They work, but it's not intuitive on the way to use it. It requires a lot of, uh, uh, to borrow another presenter's term, a lot of pain to set up all the different parameters to get it to work correctly. Um, when interfacing with Thor, the dashboard gives you the ability to explore as well as create some basic aggregations of the data. Uh, once you know what data you want to present, there's a uh, hooks provided to uh, actually publish Roxy queries that acts as a uh, caching mechanism so that the uh, report can be viewed by many people in real time without actually having to queue up in Thor. Um, similar to uh, circuits, uh, we tried to keep the technology stack as small as possible. Um, the dashboard had uh, one feature that uh, we needed to allow templating because the dashboard will actually eventually be client facing. So once you've published an executive summary of the data and you want a client or an executive to look at, you want to be able to actually theme the site to match your brand um, since uh, you may not want it to be saying HPCC systems all over the uh, branding on it. Um, let's see. You can uh, read through the uh, infrastructure requirements there. It's uh, pretty minimal, uh, minimalistic. Um, we utilize the same uh, authentication model as we did in circuits. So it's using Active Directory to authenticate and then using MBS for uh, granular access control. Um, because of uh, some uh, driver uh, support, the dashboard actually requires uh, HPCC 5, uh, whereas circuits uh, will work on 4.2 or greater. So uh, with dashboard, we are targeting uh, BI users, statistical modelers, and data analysts. Dashboard, dashboard will provide a way to publish reports and executive summaries through user roles which only allow viewing predefined uh, dashboards. So uh, there'll be multiple different roles. Uh, you'll have uh, developers which will be able to explore the data and build the dashboards. And you'll also have more restrictive roles, which basically just allows the user to view predetermined dashboards. The uh, dashboard cur currently supports several uh, D3JS charts as well as a couple of uh, Google-based charts. Um, we've provided a framework to expand that, so if your favorite chart's not in the list, it's easy to add. And we're currently working on integrating it with a Gordon's Visualization Marshaller to further enhance uh, the capability there. And now we're going to uh, have fun with hotel networks and VPN in. So we can show you a live instance of the dashboard. Um, okay. I guess uh, while Drea is doing the VPN, uh, I'll take a one question. We should have time for one question in the spot there. On the circuit side, yeah. uh, currently uh, circuits is generating the ECL code within the uh, JavaScript framework. Uh, it's being reworked currently to uh, better integrate with a uh, new architecture that uh, we've codenamed Hippie. Uh, once that occurs, then the code will be generated uh, server side. So this is the uh, login screen here for uh, the dashboard, and I'm going to log into the uh, demo application here. So 
So once you log in, it'll uh, give you a list of your dashboards that you have access to. Uh, the first uh, dashboard I'm going to go through here is the uh, just a basic um, sales data dashboard. Uh, we've we've pre-built this, but I'll also uh, show you how to manipulate the settings here. So you have the ability to uh, tell at the top of chart and the uh, data that you want to hook it into. And I'm getting a little bit of artifacting with the uh, projectors. Uh, you can set up the type of uh, layout you want. So you can change your layout from uh, two, ro uh, two columns, three columns, or a single column based on what type of data you have. So if we switch it over to a uh, single column here and save it, it should uh, refactor it so that uh, our tables are or our charts are grouped in a, into a single column. So it depends on the size and the width of the data as to which the layout works best. Um, also, the type of screen size you're looking at. Uh, projectors are a little bit smaller than the typical desktop monitor these days. So you can go into any one of these charts and you can modify the uh, parameters that you're storing. Uh, you can also add in uh, chart filters. So if we wanted to uh, filter the current chart down by product vendor, we could drop the product vendor in here and select a few product vendors here and save it. Um, the data is grouped into measures and attributes. Basically, measures are your uh, numeric data types and uh, attributes are your string data types. With the measures, you can control a little bit of the uh, aggregation. So you can actually uh, graph it based on the uh, average count, minimum, maximum, sum, and uh, just uh, raw data. And the processing is actually handled on the HPCC side. So it's not going to bottleneck through the uh, Java web application. So uh, the demo that Dre ran a few minutes ago in circuits for the uh, NLP processing, we've also built a, um, a dashboard around that data. So a little bit easier to read than the raw uh, table that she had up there. You can see that we have a, basically what that process did is it extracted a organization locations and persons out of uh, news articles. And from that data, we had 53.5% uh, of the uh, entities extracted were organizations. And then over here, you can see the top entities found. We had uh, the US, we had 84 records that contained uh, US, and we had 27 records that contained Japan. Is there mm -hmm. any more details you want to? Expand no. on that. Okay. Um, within the dashboard, um, we're currently working on integrating a dynamic uh, charting so that you can actually click on the charts and it'll dynamically update across the charts. Uh, you you can also predefine a select uh, group of filters that will allow you to. Instead of having to go through these uh, edit menus, it'll actually give you a list of filters at the top of the dashboard, and you can narrow it down there. So uh, the dashboard is uh, in, I think, initial release um, currently, and the circuits uh, application is targeted to middle of uh, 2015, I believe. So that is the quick dashboard demo and so far software is working like it should. Which one is it? This one? Yeah. Okay. So we've given you a, a, a brief overview of the two applications themselves. There is actually a lot of exciting stuff going on with both of them. Uh, with circuits, for example, as I mentioned before, we're going to be expanding the various plugins available to cover the full range of uh, functionality that you would expect to find in ECL. We're going to be doing tighter integration with the dashboard so that you can seamlessly build a composition in circuits. You can run it, and then you can go to the dashboard, look at the data, alter it, save it, go back to circuits. 
and not really have to switch back and forth between the two applications. We're also taking advantage of a recent, um, recently built API, the HPCC Java API. And what that is, is that is a Java interface which uh, allows you to call any of the web services, the SOAP services currently available through ECL Watch as actual, <coughs> excuse me, as actual Java calls. Um, it's very useful and it really eliminates a lot of the work that a lot of people encounter when you're building a front end to HPCC. You can just basically call, if it's a Java application, you can call this, uh, call whatever methods you need to and have it passed on to ECL and HPCC. And finally, we're going to be doing more security and uh, role-based integration with MBS. Currently, Circuits has some basic, basic authentication going on. But as more people use uh, circuits and the other technologies that are going to be using HIPI, in addition to circuits and dashboard, we'll need to make things a bit more granular. So you could have people, say, uh, building a particular composition. You could have other people running it. You might have a, a batch processor that needs to do certain things but doesn't need access to other areas. So MBS authentication is going to be expanded as well. And the other uh, more exciting aspect of the circuit's future is our integration with HIPI. Now, you've heard this term kind of sprinkled around today. HIPI stands for HPCC Integrated, uh, HPCC um, Plugin Integrated Engines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't ask me what dude means. But um, what HIPI is, is it is an abstraction of a set of things that happen over and over and over again. And what that said is, is the need to take ECL and the knowledge that ECL macros and functions and scripts represent, and in a way similar to what Kel has been doing, encapsulate that and make it available to a larger audience so that uh, analyst doesn't necessarily need to know exactly how you would generate an alert list or how you would um, clean addresses or append a Lexus ID. All they need to know is that, oh, here are some plugins. I need to do this, I need to do this, et cetera, et cetera. Hippie will handle the storage of that. It will handle, um, in fact, it'll handle about 70% of what is currently built into circuits and allow a person to build a composition in circuits, publish it, and then run it in any other application that also integrates with Hippie. We're also going to uh, begin to test and certify plugins as they're developed. So here's, here's kind of an example, right? We have a lot of stuff that Circuits does. It's a UI, but it also generates the HTML for a plugin. It generates the ECL, as you were asking earlier, on the front end. It runs that ECL against a cluster. And all of those features of Circuits are going to be integrated into Hippie, and Circuits is going to be calling Hippie on the server side. And as a result, what Circuits is going to become is basically a, a rich GUI, a rich front end um, to allow you to access a centralized repository of not only plugins to do a whole bunch of different interesting things, but also of pre-built compositions, of common uh, templates for certain tasks that happen over and over again. And tomorrow, I'm going to be speaking more about Hippie, the back end of this whole new concept, and uh, Joe's going to be talking about uh, another front-end application that we're developing. It's going to also interface with Hippie. So the future of the dashboard is similar. Um, we're going to enhance ease of use. There are actually a lot of things currently in the works. One thing we can do right now that's uh, very useful is the dashboard can not only access data files on the Thor cluster, it can also access Roxy services. So you can have a dashboard that's service-based. You can pass in whatever parameters you need to, and that dashboard can be automatically updated with the result um, coming back from a service, which is really useful if you have um, very large data sets or that you want you know, pre-computed queries and indexes that you want to be able to display on a dashboard. We're also going to be expanding the ability of the dashboard to um, export, to print out, be able to take a dashboard and put it into an executive summary that might be a Word document or a PDF, export it to Word, export it to Excel, make it more portable. And finally, we're going to implement the uh, visualization marshaller, 
what you see here is another topic that we're going to go into depth on tomorrow. And that is um, the creation of a visualization widget. It's a front-end JavaScript-based widget, which basically can access a Thor data set or a Roxy service or anything directly. Um, and as long as your widget implements the necessary interface, you can say, here is the source for the data to show in this widget. That widget can be shown in any front-end web application. Dashboard is going to be taking advantage of that and replacing its own custom-built visualizations with the ever-expanding uh, world of visualization widgets that we already have a pretty impressive number of and pretty impressive variety. That covers not only things like bar charts and pie charts, but also um, uh, like relevant style or graph relationships, um, and also complicated interactive dashboards where you can you know, click on this, and this shows up, click on that, and this shows up. So that's going to dramatically and impressively expand what the dashboard can currently do. And finally, we will also implement scored search support. Um, I don't know if any of you recall earlier, but scored search is basically a way to um, do uh, advanced analytics upon a data set using a s set of Roxy services, to, or you can basically you can weight things, you can um, come up with models, and then in real time run that model against a very large set of data, come back with the results, um, hopefully with some significant statistics that'll help you out. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, and that's about it. So we have, I think, a couple of minutes if there are any questions. Well, I'm wondering how uh, cross-browser compatibility works. Currently, we've tested it with Firefox, with Chrome, and with Internet Explorer. And have they done Safari yet? Uh, we're working on uh, refining Safari. Um, it works pretty well under Safari for Windows, but under Safari for Mac, there's uh, some testing mm -hmm. and uh, remediation that we need to do on that. But uh, we're targeting all four of the major uh, browsers. And we're also uh, planning to refine it so that it'll work on the iPad. Uh, Flow will stay supported. Um, it's completely open source. Um, for an actual timeline, I'd have to defer to Flavio. Uh, he's shaking his head, so he's agreeing with me. So. <laughs> um, you said that uh, eventually you're going to be able to hook into Roxy services and return back a product response. When, what is your target on that? In, in the dashboard, you mean? Mm -hmm. We can currently do that with the dashboard. OK. Yeah. Um, are these open source? Or? Dashboards is open source. Um, circuits is a bit more complex, because some of the technology we're going to be integrating into it is uh, um, going to be proprietary coming up. Currently, it's, it's kind of in a limbo state because it's still in development. But the dashboard end of things is open source. With Yahoo deciding to support the YUI development, are we looking at possibly moving to another JavaScript for the circuits? Did you mean, are we planning to move away from YUI yeah. to something else? That's always a possibility. Because we're doing um, such a kind of a dramatic refactoring of the back end of circuits, we'll also be evaluating the best technologies to use for the front end. But no decisions have been made yet. In the for circuits, you mean? Mm -hmm. Th that is an interesting question. Um, in the Hippie product that's currently being developed, that's actually being taken into account up front, 
where a user will be able to create a composition, what you see here on the circuit's UI. Um, it can then be published to a production repository, at which point it would have separate permissions which would only allow it to be run um, under certain circumstances. So we're gonna be using MBS user authentication as well as um, possibly multiple repositories uh, to help control source code and compositions. Yes? Um, you said it's gonna uh, integrate into Roxy in the future, but so it's Thor based now. So you get all your information when you execute something based off Thor, right? For the dashboard? For or either product. For the dashboard, you can currently access Roxy. Um, I'm not, is that in the actual official release available on GitHub right now? Yes, it's, it's in the official mm -hmm. release uh, mm -hmm. to access the Roxy queries. Uh, you're a little bit more limited when you're using Roxy on uh, doing any type of aggregation, uh, but you, you can build the graphs around the uh, existing um, aggregation that was built into the Roxy uh, query. Okay, so my, my point was is if it is based off Thor, Thor is one at a time type yep. of job, so you, know, mm -hmm. you need to have, have a queuing mechanism or tell the user that, you know, Joe next to you just submitted something that gets some information, right? Right. Uh, the Thor side of it is designed a little bit more for exploring the data, um, so it's not going to be something that's uh, uh, It'll be quick. It's not going to be quick. It's going to mm -hmm. be queued, as you pointed out. Um, the concept is to actually run parallel Thors on a cluster that allows you a little bit more concurrency. Um, since you're not doing as heavy lifting as uh, some of the more advanced uh, big data problems are, um, but once you have your data uh, mined down to the level that you want to build a, a dashboard for an executive or for a client, uh, then the idea is to publish that as a ROTC query so that you can have many users looking at it at the same time. Does it have an option to use the filter conditions? It has an option to use filter conditions, yes. Uh, currently, accessing external files um, is not something we have, but it's on the list to be built. Right now, for the initial release, you can load data in from an existing data set, whether CSV or Thor, but we're going to be extending that so that you have the ability to load from a landing zone file, to load from a remote file, all of the other um, you know, features that you would have when you're trying to get data into ECL. But you can spray, uh, you can browse any file that's been sprayed to the yeah. cluster, to the Thor, through the Thor hits. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on the permission structure. But yeah. yeah. Any user of circuits has a set of um, HPCC clusters configured that they need to enter their usernames and passwords for, and those are the ones that they can access. I don't think it's ever going to be a true replacement. Like most of these applications that one sees for um, big data management, you're always going to have people doing down in the weeds development in ECL. What this is handy for is for people that, uh, well, first of all, people that are coming into ECL, if they want to build something quickly, um, to just kind of see how it works and then take what they've built and follow that into ECL. It's also designed primarily for people like um, the data scientists, those sexy data scientists who um, may want to play around with their data without having to um, deal with the learning curve for ECL, which isn't that bad, but it's still a learning curve. It's a, it's, it's a language like any other. Um, and the last thing which it's most useful for is going to be for wrapping uh, existing ECL chunks and making them available to other people to use so that you cut down on the amount of uh, duplicate development that I'm sure anyone here who's worked in ECL, in RISC, or anywhere else, you know, you always end up with two people wanting to do the same thing. But if there's a list of plugins published and available for them to kind of look through and say, oh, okay, yeah, that does what I need to do, it uh, speeds up the development process. There's a hand up over there. Mm -hmm. 
And so the question is, does circuits have any sort of a scheduling capability to automatically run um, a generated ECL? Circuits right now doesn't, but once we switch out to use HIPPY for our back end, HIPPY does include that capability. So any job you create can be run with certain uh, stored variables that you can set up either at runtime or at uh, design time. If the data scientists are making mistakes like distributing wrong or getting skew errors, is mm -hmm. Circuits going to fix those kind of errors for <laughs> us? <laughs> well, eventually Circuits is not going to be a owner of ESO, ECL so much as a provider of ECL. So if you have um, the, the magic Joe Pritchard here who creates certain plugins which do certain things with ECL and you have Jesse over here that does other plugins and someone ends up using them, those plugins will be responsible for the ECL they contain. So um, the owners of various plugins will be published and known. And also, you know, you, yeah, they can be tweaked and altered as problems are found with distribution and skew errors. The ECL will be available for you to examine in circuits. So you can have a look and, you know, if you want, you can take it, debug it, run it, and uh, kind of figure out yourself what the best fix is for your problem. And also, as we lean on to uh, Kel, then That's Kel true. will uh, solve some of the mm -hmm. skew issues that you mentioned. That is another thing which circuits is going to be uh, capable of is not only will we be able to have ECL plugins, but we'll also have Kel plugins. You can take a, a Kel, a very complex Kel attribute, and do a lot of things with it. We'll also have salt plugins, so you can basically take any data set and immediately run a scored search, data hygiene, linking, things like that, simply by adding a plugin to the chain instead of all the work that salt currently requires. We have a question. Mm -hmm. That's access. a good question. I don't, I don't believe we currently do, but um, can the dashboard currently draw data from named outputs of work units? I don't think so. It has to be a logical it's file. Currently, it's logical files and Roxy queries that are supported. A so called. <laughs> currently, no. But again, um, once we switch to using the the visualization widgets, they, they do currently support named output visualizations, yep. as well as external services and soap calls. OK, any thank more that's questions? I think that's it. Then. OK, yeah. well, thank you all for your patience and for staying over. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Joe and Drea. So that concludes our agenda for today. Um, 14 speakers in one day it was uh, quite, a, quite a day. So I'd like to just ask for a big round of applause for all the speakers for today, especially the external speakers we had. Also, a, uh, a special thank you to all those that are watching online through our live stream on YouTube. Um, we're going to be signing off, so thank you and have a good night.